Okay, it's a brand new morning, brand new day. ZJB Radio, of course, live from out of Montserrat. Good morning, everybody. Great to have you on board. And I uh, did promise you that uh, Dr. Samuel Joseph would be in. I think that they've just finished uh, at uh, a Parliament. And uh, so he's made his way right up to ZGB Radio. Let me say a very pleasant morning to the Honorable Dr. Samuel Joseph. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Basil. Good morning, everybody. And how are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Happy to be here. And you're looking sharp, boy. In that jacket and tie and, and all of that, you know? Part of my attire. <laughs> Part of your attire. Indeed, indeed. How are things on your end? Things are going okay so far. I mean, we just finished the, as I said, wrap-up parliament, which was a continuation of the entire budget session. This was my first one, and I must say part of the experience was interesting, enlightening, and in some sense educational. Indeed. Take us back to how it all started for you, this poli uh, politics thing, man. It started in 2014 when I ran on the MCAP ticket. Because at that time I thought that there were certain things that I would like to see done, and the only way that, not the only way, but one of the ways I could get it accomplished was to get involved in politics. So as you know, I ran in 2014, and I wasn't successful, but I didn't give up. I kept on on the radio, kept on advocating for the things I wanted. Then the Honorable Leader of the Opposition at that time, Ruben Timid, resigned, created an opening in the Legislative Assembly. A by-election was called, and I was put forward by my party, MCAP ran again and this time I was successful. So I'm trying to make use of the opportunity to represent the people and to try to push forward some of the things that I have been always advocating for. Indeed. Okay, so um, I know that you were at your first budget debate, as you said. Uh, give us your thoughts on that. Part of it was, as I said at the beginning, interesting. Part of it was disappointing because after we got the budget debate, I guess I should go back. What well, some people must understand that the actual speech that you hear that the Premier or the Honorable Minister of Finance delivers is not the actual budget. There's a separate document with the numbers in it. So what I did when we got that, when we heard the speech the Friday, the weekend, I actually went back to the speech and then tried to match back what was said in the speech with what the actual numbers are. Because, you know, politicians love to grandstand and say they're doing all these things, but in the end is what the numbers actually say what your actual plans are. So we did that for the entire weekend, me and Eastern. We got some other consultants, some of the other former people that were in the house to help us to go through it and try to compare what was said in the actual budget speech to what's in the actual numbers. Then I thought we did a good job of pointing out the comparison between the two. So I was hoping that there would be a response back from the Honorable Minister of Finance to some of the questions that was raised. And that re didn't really happen, so I found that disappointed because you're trying to have an actual debate, actual discussion about the issues. So you propose this and then we say, okay, you propose this, but we are the numbers, how will we finance, how will we work? And you're ex I was expecting a response to some of the questions that were raised and there was not really any response. It was just a rehashing of back of the budget speech and I found that disappointed, disappointing because I wanted answers. I actually wanted answers to the questions and I believe some members of the public and the listening audience also wanted some answers to the questions and that those weren't forthcoming. Okay, well from, from where you sit, and I know that you've been on the streets, you've been around, what, what's the feedback like? What are people saying to you? I believe that before the budget there was some kind of hype about it. Created, some of it was created by the Premier himself when he came on radio and said there's a lot of things in the budget. So people were looking forward to what's in it. And also remember that the budget was delayed for two months and something. So people were wondering why was it delayed, so what's really the issue, so there's a great expectation to what's in it. And I believe that after the budget speech was read and people realized what was in it, there was a sense of disappointment that people didn't really see the hope that they wanted, they didn't really see the programs that would actually take Monsat forward. And we checked social media and it talking on the street, a lot of people were saying, oh, we thought something else would be in it and there's really nothing in it. And that's kind of sad in a sense because you do want to see Monsort go forward and you do want to see that there's hope and you do want people to believe that something better is coming. But the general mood is, is that the budget is standard and in some sense it's worse than the one that was presented last year if you go through the numbers. And that's in some, that's kind of sad that you would want people to have hope, people to say there's something to hold on for and which is why even though we have to be careful as opposition members, etc. Even though you might, you might think that the budget could have been better and you want to hold the government to task to say maybe you should have done this and maybe you should have tried this, you still want people to have hope in their country, still want people to believe that they can 
contribute and that there's something that can make Montserrat better. So there's a balancing act that you have to do. Hold the government to account to the things that they say, but still at the same time maintain hope in the population that better is coming and despite the numbers in the budget, we can still do something to get Montserrat to be better. What, what are some of the lows for you uh, during the budget um, speech? Because the interesting one, not a low, but the interesting one that people are looking forward to the salary increase. So a lot of people, as you know, there hasn't been a salary increase for a long time and people are complaining that they need more money, etc., etc. So you are looking forward to what the actual number was. When it 3% came out, it was disappointing because you think that that number was better. So I said, okay, they finally gave a raise. That's good, no matter how small it is. It's still, uh, people are still getting more money. So then you have to actually look through the numbers now to see where did that raise come from. And then the first thing that you realize that the raise did not come because new money was added by was added to the budget. You have to take that money from something else to give the raise. So there's still the same amount of money circulating in the economy, although there was a $1.4 million raise. Things was cut to give that raise. So that was, that was a low. And then the other confusing part that I still haven't fully understood, and that I hope that the Premier would have enlightened us on, although you gave a $1.4 million raise for salaries, if you look at the actual numbers in the budget, the total salary number is less than last year. So to me, the, one of the only ways that's possible is if this year there are less people employed by the government. Because if you're increasing salaries by $1.4 million and the total salary number is less, less, to me the only, well, I tried to think of another explanation and I can't come up with one, so I'm going to say the only explanation I can come up with is that there's less people or less people will be employed by the government this year. So that was a uh, low for me. And then the other part that I, there was a big hype about the Cork Hill thing and that this is what's going to drive the country forward. So I was hoping to get more clarification, for example, from the other ministers. Because if an actual government plan to do something, I would think, for example, the Ministry of Communication and Works would be involved. But I didn't hear anything from them concerning it. You didn't hear anything from trade concerning it. So after a while it occurred to me, it's not really this great plan that was done. It was just something added in at the side. So when I looked at the budget, there was no big overall economic plan going forward. Minister Lewis spoke about his plans in terms of solar, etc. Claude Hogan, the Honourable Minister, spoke about his plans, etc. Delmar gave a thing about her ministry and what she plans to do forward. But the Ministry of Finance itself, what are the actual things that the Ministry of Finance is doing as a Minister of Finance for economic development, etc. That I didn't, I didn't hear, and that was a disappointment to me that you are the leader of government business and the direction has to come from the top. This is what the overall economic policy is, and then when your ministers speak after, they feed back into the overall government plan, okay, this is what our premier said is going to do, and this is how our departments and et cetera will help to assist in that plan. But when you listen to the debates, it seems that each individual ministry is basically on their own, which is bad in some sense because it might be speculation, but it shows that the government is not together as it should be and it's going to create a problem. It's not politics, but we have an organization and all the members are not working to, together towards one common goal and each individual member is just trying to do their own thing to try to make themselves look better. You are going to create problems. So when I looked at the budget and the budget statement, I didn't get this overall theme that everybody was on the same page. This is the policy and plan we are going forward, so let's work together. It was more like it's two and a half years, it's now we are starting. So it's now we are going to hire an economic advisor, it's now we are going to hire a setback of our project management office. So basically, it's now basically what I got that the government is starting their programs halfway through their term, and I found that to be disappointing. Two and a half years is too long to now be starting. Okay, so let's talk about some of the positives that you got out of, um, out of the budget. Um, speech? Because one positive is that because when you remember the electricity was creating problems and people equipment went and we were on the radio all the time pushing that something can be done despite what Muller said right, saying that they're not responsible and there's nothing that can be done is something we always advocated that the government can do something and one of the things that they can do is for example drop 
the duty on appliances, etc. And they did put that into the budget and said white appliances, which are basically mean fridges, etc., stove. They dropped the duty on it so that if you are basically arguing if some of your things got damaged, you can get them in duty free. So that was a that was a positive development to try to get people to get back some of the stuff that they may have lost. In some sense, the appointment of the CEO in the Premier's office to deal with private sector development, or I don't think it's enough after what was there before, I see that there's some step going forward to recognize that we have to find other ways to get the private sector and more so develop and to get foreign investors. So at least there will be at least one person now in the Premier's office who I, be, well, I would presume that they are now responsible for trying to deal with private sector matters and trying to get foreign investment. As I don't believe it's enough, but to me that was a positive because it shows that there's some kind of understanding that yes, we need aid, yes, we need stuff from DFID, yes, we need stuff from the EU, we're still a small country and we're not at that stage where we can do, do our own stuff, we need outside money, and yes, you have to advocate for that money, but at the same time, you have to simultaneously try to figure out internally how you're going to get your own money, how you're going to build your private sector, how you're going to get in foreign money. And you could see well, reluctantly that there's some kind of push now towards that direction, and I found that to be a positive thing in the budget. I want you to take me back. Uh, you spoke a little while ago about um, how disappointed you were um, when we spoke about the increase for public sector workers and all of that. What, what, what is the, the, the word on the street uh, from the people that you meet regarding this? Well, most people are asking if it's just that. And that's the comment you're getting. When you tell them it's 3% and they're actually calculating, they're like, but it's just that, that's nothing. I, more, the majority of people I've spoken to are disappointed in the actual increase that they got. I believe that they appreciate the fact that they have gotten an increase and any small amount is an amount, but I don't think that the majority of people are overjoyed with the amount of money that they got. Most people are still disappointed in it. And my disappointment in the whole thing, as I said, is not new money. And you might argue, well, DFID is not giving any new money. But if you actually look at the numbers which I pointed out in my presentation, it's not really true because they gave $5 million extra. And that $5 million extra was for TCs. And not only did they give $5 million extra for TCs, that money is ring-fenced. In other words, only, the money can only be spent on TCs. So you're basically giving or negotiating however it was gotten, $5 million extra in the budget for 15 or so people, and then you're getting $1.4 million, which you have to take from goods and services and other things for the 900 people in the civil servants. And something is off there. And when it was brought up, the response, again, from both the whip on the government side, Mr. Willock, and the Premier, was basically defending it. You didn't get the impression that they were saying, oh, we fought $45 million to give the raise for our civil servants. They're basically defending, basically the TCs are doing the work, why don't you guys want them to get paid? And that I found strange, because if, you, if they were saying, we tried to negotiate for this $5 million to give the raise, but we weren't successful, because DFID basically said that this is the only thing you can do with the money. You can have some kind of understanding for that. But when they're saying, this is what it is, and I don't know why you guys are arguing about that, I have a problem with it. So I don't buy the argument when they say, well, we couldn't have given any more because we had no choice. Because as far as I could see pop from the public statements, they are agreeing with the $5 million ring fence for the TCs. And that can't be right, because as I keep saying, you are elected to represent the people of Montserrat. You weren't elected to be employees of the aid agencies, and you weren't elected to defend the policies of England. That's for the English politicians to defend the policies of England. The job of the local politicians is to defend the interests of the people of Montserrat. So if they're telling you they have $5 million extra because we have capacity gaps, you have to be able to fight them and say, no, that $5 million cannot only be for TCs. Yes, we have capacity gaps. But we can take some of that money and educate our people, whether in university or trade schools or separate government internal programs to up people's skills to get things doing better. It's not enough to say that we have poverty gaps and you know what, maybe we don't have people in Montserrat to do it. Then the answer is not 
to bring TCAs to solve it we know it don't work? The answer has to be to develop the local population and be serious about it and get the funding to do it and develop the local population. Because the idea that sometimes they push that, you know what, these words that we love to use, oh, someone, some people bad minded and they're not working with you, someone they don't want to do the work, etc. But it's up to you to find the courage to fix that problem. Because why do you think that the TCAs, they're human beings also, they have the same fallibilities, they have the same faults, they have the same selfishness and greed, they're the same human beings like you? Why do you think that they're more honest? Why do you think that they'll do their jobs in a better way? Why do you think they don't suffer from the same temptation? Why do you think that the procurement officer won't try to get the ferry contract for his friends? Why do you think the infrastructure development people won't try to get the buildings to be built by the friends in the Royal Navy or whatever? They're still they're connected the same way to other people. They have access to the money. They have the same temptations. So the idea of trying to sell that, you know what, Maybe the TCs will be better because you know what some monsters and people are bad minded or, or whatever. All human beings have the same temptations and if you're saying those issues exist, it's up to the leaders and the decision makers to put policies and plans in place and to have the courage to fix it at a local level, not trying to say we're going to import the fix and pay them five million dollars for fifteen people, but you could only find one point four million dollars for the locals and they should be happy with it because that's the best we can do. I, I don't think that's good enough. And uh, what about the, the, the comments during the uh, budget debate uh, coming from the, de um, the different ministers? W what are your thoughts on that? They did a comprehensive job of listing out the things that the department did. So if you actually listened, I could have understood what the Ministry of Education and Health etc. was trying. I could have understood what MCL did and what the plans are. So I thought that was very well done, that it was very comprehensive. You could get an idea of what they were doing, how the money was spent, what they planned to do. I mean, it was long in some sense, and I would like going forward that, yes, these reviews are good, but if there could be a continuous update. So come on your show. If something is happening, tell the people what was happening. If you went away to a meeting, come back on the radio and do a press conference and explain to the people what's happening. If you are the leader of government business and you're the minister of finance, you have to be able to come on radio and do a live press conference. It's not enough to have a private recording that you edit after to let it come out to sound a certain way. You are leading the country, you have to be able to do it live. Same thing for the other ministers. You need to be able to come on radio live and speak. Because you have to remember that this politics is local, but part of it is regional and international. You're going away to meetings. So what you're saying, if you can't do that live and answer certain hard questions, how do you perform in a meeting when you're having a discussion and they bring up a point or they say something? Do you have to wait to go back home and call back somebody to see what your response to be? It's too late. And I don't think that a lot of people appreciate that when the ministers, etc., so travel to represent you, they're in front of their peers, they're in front of other technicians and statements are made live, so what do you think about that? If you can't respond quick enough in terms of representing monster interests, you're not doing your job, and one of the ways to practice for it, in some sense, is to come on shows like yours, come on the other shows and do an actual live press conference where the press is asking you hard questions about how the country is going, how things are going. I know people have said that we are too hard in the government, but I actually don't think that if, in monster context when you look at the rest of the world that we are hard, the kind of questions that you see Trump and Theresa May and these other leaders have to take directly from the press live. We don't have that. We don't have that here. We come and read with our press secretary with our prepared statements and our prepared questions and we read out the answers. It's completely different to how the politicians in the uh, part of the world have to operate. And then you're going to meet with them to have a meeting about OECS issues and CARICOM issues and Brexit issues. If you cannot come and do such thing live, it begs the question of how good do you do when you go away to represent Montserrat. And I think part of it shows up when you see like certain items in the budget and realize that they said that this is it and there's no power from the Montserrat end or the ability from the Montserrat end to push back at it. And that to me is an issue. Where do, you, where do you see uh, this latest budget taking months, right? 
Well, it's almost the same as last year. So if everything goes as is, however things were last year, it's going to be basically the same this year and in some sense slightly worse because there's less money for certain things. Because I said, although the salary increase, the total salary number is less, so there's no more spending power. For example, for the Minister Lewis budget, he got 14 million last year for roadworks, etc. This year he already got seven. And a lot of the construction jobs and roadworks were done through his ministry. So if he has half as much money as he had last year, there is going to be a problem coming up quickly. And as you realize, the bridge by Nick is down. So some money is going to have to be gotten or allocated out of things that wasn't budgeted for to do that bridge. And I think it's going to kill his budget. So those local jobs for construction, you're hoping from roadworks, unless we get funding quickly from some other source, maybe BNTF, which is not going to come up until October, there's going to be a gap where I think construction is going to go down for a while. There's some money in the budget that you see for the social housing that has been there for two years running and there's some internal fight conflict going on between DFID and the Ministry of Housing concerning those houses to be built. If they don't get built this year again, there's going to be problems. There's some money that you see for lookout for ten houses, which is confusing again to us because that money was there last year and it was never spent. So again, it would be nice to get an explanation why was that money allocated to fix the four ten houses in lookout and it wasn't done and the money just got rolled over. So if some of these things get done, like the lookout houses and the seven million for road work get done, you could see some kind of project starting. But things like appointing a PMO and appointing an energy director and appointing a CEO in the office and fiber optic cable and money for geothermal is not going to generate any local jobs. So unless there's some new negotiation happening, the economy this year, the way I see it, is going to be either slightly worse or about the same as last year. But people were complaining last year. So I'm hoping that something else comes up that you know that there's a new defeat representative coming, that some new discussion happens or something comes from the EU or some new discussion comes up to generate a new source of money. Otherwise, basically, I see this year being the same as last. Okay. Everybody, we've been speaking to uh, uh, the Honorable Dr. Sammy Joseph. He's right here. And uh, we're going to round up. Um, final word for the people this morning? The budget is what the budget is. The government does its job but we have to remember as a people we also have a job to do despite what the government does i know we love to put a lot of blame on the government because they have a duty and they need to do their duty but they can't do everything we still have responsibility as citizens and as people to are there things outside of government that we can do to get monster forward are there business things that we can do are there things in sports that we can do and the other problem i find in general as citizens we are too passive so if you think that, as an example, as a sporting community, there are issues, you need to get together as a body, get a representative, and put the case forward to government that you want these things to do. Come and radio and advocate for them. Is that small businesses you believe that there are things that the government policy should do? Come together as an organization and bring it forward to the relevant people. And again, come on radio and agitate. We have to be able to have the courage to speak about the things that we want done despite what people might say that you're talking down the country you shouldn't do these things. Things only change if pressure is put on certain spots. So have the courage to come forward and question your leaders whether they're on the opposition side or whether they're on the government side to push for certain issues and despite what's in the budget as I said we have to still find ways to go forward and we should never reach a point where we release the pressure off of the government. They were hired to do a job and they were hired to represent you and to find solutions and that's what they're getting paid for. And questioning them and asking them to do their job is not being mischievous. That is why they were elected to do a job of moving Monsat forward and to represent you. So if you have needs and wants and things that you think should happen, bring it forward. And I think if we keep on having these kind of discussions and people start to realize what needs to be done and come together as a civil society and the government and we work together. I think that's the only way we're going to change Montserrat. If we start to understand that we have to start doing things for ourselves 
and move away from dependent on other people to care about us. Nobody's going to care about yourself more than you, and that's the fundamental point. So you have to start believing that we have the ability, we have the capacity, and what we need now is the will to actually push forward with that. And that's basically my message to the people today. Dr. Sammy Joseph, Honorable, thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chambers. <laughs> This is 95.5 FM, Set JB Radio. That was good, that was alright. <laughs>